After hundreds of hours of research, dozens of hours of presenting this information to you, I'm gonna present my final conclusions and summary on the great taking. I have some good news and I have some bad news. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity and I'm here with my final summary of The Great Taking. And this has been an incredible journey. I have just huge respect for David Rogers Webb who kicked this off with his book, The Great Taking. And you see there the book, I did an interview with him before and we'll have more interviews with him. This is what's transpired after all of the research. I just wanted to summarize it for you in one spot. This is gonna be difficult to do because it is a lot of material, but I'll do my best. And as well, I just want to forewarn you that we're gonna be taking all of our great taking material and pulling it back from lots of the public spaces out there. And it's gonna be always freely available on our website, but we feel the need to make sure that we are not exposed to uh, the censors because this is highly sensitive material. There's a lot of people out there who do not want this information out there for good reason. It's a lot of money on the line. The raccoons and scoundrels really like their skimming and grifting operations, and of course they are threatened by this, and nothing gets them upset quite like pointing out the ways in which they are trying to bamboozle everybody. So, what do we know? We started out by saying, look, we want to address these extraordinary claims, perhaps none more so than this, that this book, The Great Taking, is about the taking of collateral. All of it, says David Rogers Webb, right? Uh, it's a long, execu long planned, executed, intelligent design, audacity and scope, difficult to encompass in the mind. All financial assets. This is money on deposit at banks, stocks, bonds, everything, all underlying property. Could this be true? This is a that's crazy talk. What do you mean? Um, and along the way, we always wondered, though, how do we answer this question? Who's going to eat the losses? We know that we have this extraordinary debt problem in the United States, which by extension means the whole Western world, as goes the United States. So it goes, obviously, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but also Europe. <clears throat> and so the United States has about a third of the debt in the whole world. That's 30 some percent. And we have, what, five, six percent of the world's population. So we're pretty over leveraged. What happens if that debt blows up? Well, you'll own nothing. That's what happens with a great taking. And I don't know about how you'll be, you'll be happy part, but um, I always wondered, like, how is this going to get pulled off? Like, how do we end up owning nothing? Well, the legal machinery is all in place and it's all there. And by the way, it brings to mind this quote by Frederick Bastiat, uh, a very, very just I, I love this guy's thinking and his pithy way of saying things. And he said, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in a society over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it in a moral code that glorifies it. Hey, that's what we're talking about here today uh plunder this is legalized so-called legal legalized plunder and of course they created a legal system that authorizes enables and all of that and this is true so we had to look at that and along the way we went to the sources i went to all the sources i read through the bankruptcy code i went through the banking code there the titles i had to go to the code of federal regulations and read about various sub elements of this including uh, 17 cfr 240 the 15 c3-3 Sound, I mean, wow, boring, right? No, people, you have to know about these details. I had to know about them. I was ignorant. I wasn't paying attention. We got into this trouble because people like me just weren't paying attention. And these raccoons went about, uh, you know, lo legally lawyering up this thing, which, ta-da, <laughs> made sure that they always won and you would always or i would always be the eventual bag holder right who's going to eat the losses that's what they're trying to resolve and they've just said we wrote the laws not us right and so it's time for you to know about them it's really important ignorance is not bliss in this particular example it might not be comfortable to know what this information is but it's essential if you want to have any chance of avoiding the theft, the plundering, the great taking. If you want to do that, you have to know what the system is. You can't play a game if you don't know the rules. I'm just here explaining the rules, okay? We're reading the inside of the Monopoly box tonight. Okay. Um, as well, we had to go into the Uniform Commercial Code, some exciting developments there with David Rogers Webb recently in front of the Tennessee State Legislature talking about this, and they're seeking to uh, get out from under the UCC Article 8 provisions that uh, explicitly kind of 
decouple people from their assets under certain circumstances. And as well, we had to go to the case precedents, what's already been set in law. It's one thing to write the laws. It's quite another for the courts to interpret them. Have these laws that we were talking about been interpreted in set in case precedents in the court? The answer is yes. So we we'll talk about a couple of those cases. Now, um, first thing, do you just have some, do you not own your stocks and bonds? Do you instead have something called a security entitlement? Resounding, yes, we've established that. And as well, this is what this looks like, right? So you would be over here all the way on the bottom as a, what's called a beneficial owner. If it sounds like a mouthful, you're right. What is a beneficial owner? Um, as you understand, those are legal words. And so every word matters in a legal setting. Am I a man or am I a person? Two entirely different legal codes uh, get activated depending on how that gets answered. So the issuer, which is somebody that's issuing a stock or a bond, this could be GM as a stock or Detroit as a municipal um, security, a municipal bond. And then it comes out and then there's the legal owner here and there's an intermediary and then there's another intermediary and then there's you. There could be lots more intermediaries in there. In fact, this is really a simplified system. This is what we've discovered through our investigations. The system actually looks like this comes from an SEC document where they're trying to explain how this all works. Um, and so uh, I know you can't read this, but again, way up here would be the issuer. And then this might be you. And this is your broker here. Let me, oops, let me get my, my little laser pointer. I realized. Yeah. So you got an issuer and you've got a transfer agent and then you got you, you want to buy something. And maybe this little triangle is the seller over here and it comes into your broker and the broker has to pass the order over and it comes over here and it comes into this system and up to the DTCC and here's seed and company. And then this gets passed over and blah, 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 right. It is a wildly complicated system. And guess what? Every single one of those boxes, every single one of those lines is expensive. They say, oh, this indirect ownership system allows you to have much lower cost of trading. It seems like you do. But at the end of the day, it's not possible for every single one of these Wall Street firms to get stinking rich and for it to just be a, a more efficient system for all of us too. They both can't be true. Um, so always follow the money. It's like that scene in Wolf of Wall Street, Matthew McConaughey and Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, he says... Our job is to go home with cash in our pockets at the end of every day. Each one of these is a home at the end of the day in the pocket cash making operation. Now, we also discovered that it's absolutely true that, and this was actually in David's book, which is the European Commission asked a very simple question of the Federal Reserve about this whole crazy indirect ownership security entitlement model. And they said, hey, they asked the question where securities are held in pooled form, that is a a collective securities position rather than a segregated individual position. We're not asking about those. We want to know about a collective securities position. Does the investor have rights attaching to particular securities in the pool? Answer, no. <laughs> There's, okay, can you say more? Sure. The securities entitlement holder does not have rights attaching to particular securities in the pool. Instead, he or she has a pro rata share of the interest in the financial asset held by its securities intermediary to the amount needed to satisfy the aggregate claims of the entitlement holders in that issue. This is true even if the pos investor positions are segregated. See, they had to put quotes around that, even if they're segregated. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, no, you totally have a segregated position in the pool with everybody else. <laughs> It's just, anyway, it's just, it's, it's that hysterical. Yes. Um, and that was a lot of legal gobbledygook to just say, look, there's a big pool of assets. You, let's say you owned one in 100 of those pooled assets. You have 1%. That's what you got. That's your interest in that pool. Well, what if the pool vanishes or what if it gets dinged? Well, then you have a pro rata share in whatever's left over after we, the dust settles, right? Pro rata just means you have 1% of whatever's left over. So if it gets cut in half, you now have 1% of 50 units instead of 1% of 100 units. Uh, anyway, but there it is. You don't actually own a particular stock or bond. Oh, I bought this muni bond issue, came out on this day, QSIP number, identifying a number on, on the security. I bought that one. Like, no, you didn't. You bought, a, you bought into the whole pool of those things and somehow they got put together. 
All right. Um, and then we found out that it was a little awkward to find out that priority among security interest and entitlement holders, they say, well, you know, if you have, if you have uh, a cash account only, um, and we'll get into what that means as separate from a margin account in just a second, important distinction. You got to know this um, if you want to be safe. Except otherwise noted in B and C, it turns out that, well, the claims of the entitlement holders, other than the creditor, have priority over the claim of the creditor. So they say, yeah, the, the security entitlement holders, they have priority over the creditor. Except B, claim of a creditor who has a security and a financial asset held by a security intermediary has priority over claims of the security intermediaries, right? Um, if the creditor has control over the financial assets. So we get into this concept that we had to explore and understand. What do you mean by control? And so control is an interesting thing. Like if I have money in my wallet, I, you could say I control it. And if my money goes into your pocket because I'm, I'm giving it to you as, as collateral for something, will you have control over that money in your pocket? It gets a little gray if we've given it to somebody in between the two of us to sort of hold, um, you know, in, in escrow or or in some other way. But control is simple. Do you have that asset in your system tagged and bagged and flagged as belonging to a specific person or not, right? So control is control's a big deal. This again becomes very important when we get down to um, margin versus cash accounts. Get there in a second. And they say here, see if a clearing corporation, so remember I showed you all this stuff. There's a lot of clearing corporations in between. Like if this is the seller over here, up, and you're the buyer over here there's a lot of clearing going on between in plumbing and piping between you and this person so what happens if one of these bad boys gets into trouble while while these shares are flowing back and forth and that c down here it says if a clearing corporation does not have sufficient financial assets to satisfy both its obligations to you or me the entitlement holders who have security entitlements um, the claim of the creditor has priority over the claims of the entitlement holders. Now, this is just a thing that says, look, we're really afraid of this whole system seizing and freezing up. If it ever does that, and that was almost what happened under, under the Lehman issue, this whole system works okay. In fact, I'm going to show you data later. It works pretty good as long as it's actually working. The issue is what happens if it ever stopped working and what could cause it to stop working? Well, you know what could cause it to stop working? Any one of these boxes or lines freezes up. What could cause that? Well, what if it's what if all this free flowing plumbing requires that there's a huge amount of lending and collateral movement and people doing what they do and hedge funds and banks and everybody's doing what they're doing. If one of those parties suddenly freezes because they can't like like the clearing corporation goes bankrupt. And I can't I'm the one of these intermediary, you know, lenders here and I can't I don't think I can get my money back whole system freezes up and then you have batman we have a giant problem on our hands so that's what they're trying to do is just protect the system they want the system to work that's what they want they want the system to keep working so that's why they wrote this this way now it this is what these two parts down here are exactly what tennessee is saying yeah we don't like those parts can we get get rid of those please and again it's all about who has control now this is going to get us down to the idea of a margin account versus a cash account. This was an important thing that I, I learned about this. Now, this is the all important 15C3-3. <gasps> Again, sounds super boring, but it's not. Uh, this is important. The term fully paid securities means this is a cash account, means all securities carried for the account of a customer in a cash account as defined in this regulation 12 CFR 220 as well as securities carried for the account of a customer in a margin account, right? But these are what are called excess margin account securities, okay? Um, so fully paid is means you've paid cash, like I, I put 100000 into a brokerage account and I buy $100,000 of stocks and bonds. They've all been paid for with cash. Cash went in the account, cash bought those things. Okay, fine. A margin account's different, right? This is one where your entire account, you put 100000 in, you buy 100000 of stocks and bonds, same as in the cash account. But now those 100000 enable you, because they're in their margin account, to borrow typically another 100000 On top of that, you can leverage that to buy more stocks and bonds. Because of that, because you are going to be pledging these securities as collateral, as security for that borrowing, they are now exposed, heavily exposed. So 
The term margin securities down here says means those securities carried for the account of a customer in a margin account, as defined elsewhere in those numbers and letters, as well as securities carried in any other account um, uh, referred to as a margin account, other than the securities referred to in three above. So a margin account. Um, once you have a margin account, well, now you are fully exposed, right? Because now we're getting back to this idea of control and possession. And I know this is all wildly complicated and it shouldn't be this complicated, but trust me, there's a reason we have to go into this complexity so I can set up what are the risks and what are the unknowns in the system. And then you have to make your own decision about how you process those, what those mean to you, whether you want to do something about that or not. And I'm agnostic. Everybody can come to their own conclusion. I know where I land, but where you land may be different. But first, you need and deserve to have the context. Okay, so control, customer protection, 15C3-3. This is wildly important. Um, B here says B1 is physical possession or control of securities. Nobody has physical possession anymore. It's about control, okay, which is electronic control. A broker or dealer shall promptly obtain and shall thereafter maintain the physical possession or control of all fully paid securities and excess margin securities carried by a broker or dealer for the account of customers. So even if you have a margin account, that excess um, margin securities means that if I had 100,000 and I borrowed 100,000, I have no excess margin securities because I borrowed 100% of what I could. If I had 100,000, but I borrowed 50,000, 50,000 is now up there. The other 50,000 up there by, I mean, it's, it's been, it's, they're out of my control. They're, they are now part of the system. The other 50,000 is called excess and the, the broker still has to maintain full control over those. Do they? Good question. <laughs> the answer is no, not always, at least according to the cases I surfaced, but good question. <laughs> at any rate, uh, the fee C 15, 15 C three dash three says that your your they have to maintain control over those they can't lend them out they can't hypothecate them i'll tell you what that means in a second they can't do with these other things they can't encumber them as collateral even if they're in so there's still some issues around well, how safe is that pool we'll get to that in a second but the law as it's written says that if you have a cash account or you have excess margin securities those have to be held out they have your broker has to by law carry those full amounts in its in these accounts so that if it went bankrupt those would be coming back to you that's the whole story now will they we're going to tell you that uh this is a very important conversation to have and it takes a little bit longer than the time i have available right now but it boils down to this look a physical system where you have paper certificates it has a lot of pros and cons we've covered this before i cover this with my subscribers all the time um, and we've gone over it and we've discussed it at length. It's, it's got uh, reasonable pros and cons associated with it. And then there's this indirect model, which has other pros and cons, right? It's fast. It's convenient. It's somewhat, it appears to be cheaper to us, even though it allows wall street to do a lot of crazy grifty skimmy things like, you know, run high frequency trading programs and take just fractions of a penny from every trade and, you know, crazy stuff. Um, uh, but it also, they each have different risks, right? And part of the um, modification and minimization of the risk in the indirect ownership model, which is the security entitlement model we're talking about here in the great taking, is that you have to have faith and trust that the legal system is going to fairly promptly and equitably adjudicate the troubles when they arise. And it isn't just going to side with politically favored opponents or, or you know, plaintiffs. It's not going to just side with or defendants, depending on how the case went. It's not just going to side with their special friends. It's not going to side always with the big corporations who have more money. Like It's going to actually fairly adjudicate. Now, if you think that's still the world we live in, then this is a pretty good system. If you're like me and you have questions about how fair that is now, or equitable, or if the scales of justice are in any way blind and level, uh, then you have to understand there's different risks to that system that maybe have not been fully talked about or disclosed. So that's why we're here. Now, if you want to have the, if you want to go deep into this and you want to know exactly what to do, if you have wealth that needs protection, I'm going to take all of these hundreds of hours of research I've done and I've assembled a team of really incredible experts who are going to hold a webinar. It's going to be on June 15th 
and it'll also be recorded. So that's uh, a Saturday. If you can't make the actual day for the live webinar, it's okay. You can watch the recording. Those of you who come to the live webinar, you'll be able to ask questions. And if those are the ones that we select, you will be able to ask questions directly of people who can answer things about special forms of uh, retirement accounts that protect you in this regard, things that you can do around direct ownership, uh, going towards a direct ownership system, ways in which to protect yourself through different holdings within uh, the bond system, et cetera. There are things we can do. And so we want to talk about those and make sure that everybody who cares about this has a chance to hear this in a really condensed form. And this is just about solutions. We're not going to do a whole lot of problem definition. We've got some special keynote lecturers who are going to come in and help us understand really what the risks are from a high level. But beyond that, specifically, what can you do? Early bird pricing is 33% off, ends May 15th. And just go to peak prosperity, peak slash prosperity.com. I mean, peak hyphen prosperity.com slash event, event two. Um, event one was that incredible webinar with Peter St. Ange and Brett Weinstein and, um, and Ed Dowd and myself. That one's, that one's amazing. Great feedback on that. So carrying on, hypothecation. We have to know what this word is, so we'll do a quick definition. It's a big fancy word, hypothecation, five syllables, right? Um, hypothecation occurs when an asset is pledged as collateral to secure a loan. The owner of the asset does not give up the title, however. They don't give up possession or any ownership rights, right? Such as income generated by the asset. However, the lender can seize the asset if the terms of the agreement are not met. So I could hypothecate my car to you, right? And say, hey, here, I, I need uh, $5,000 and, you know, I'm going to pledge my car against that. But I still get to drive it and I get use from it. And if I'm using it as an Uber, I'm making money off of that. None of that belongs to you, right? But if I default on my $5,000, you can come and take my car, right? So that's hypothecation. So what does this have to do with your brokerage accounts? Well, it has this. Um, this is an important rule, 248C-1, which talks about why are you protected in your cash account? Because it says here, this is a very clear rule. It says no member of a national securities exchange, right? And no broker or dealer who transacts a business in securities through the medium of any such member shall directly or indirectly hypothecate or arrange for or permit the continued hypothecation of any securities carried for the account of any customer under these circumstances, right? Um, so you can't commingle the securities. That's the green part down there. In blue, it says, uh, you know, uh, under any under circumstances that will permit securities carried for the account of customers to be hypothecated or subject to any lien or liens, blah, blah, blah. I'll let you read that. This says that it, there's a rule on the books that says, you know, if you're a broker and you're holding these things and you have control over these assets in your cash accounts or your excess margin security accounts, you also cannot hypothecate them. Meaning this is what the brokerage will do with your, with your margin securities. They'll hypothecate them. Buddy, they will loan those things out. They'll sell them. They'll allow other people to sell them short. They will uh, do all kinds of things where they are generating money off of your cash, your bonds, your stocks in your margin account. As well, we'll find out and see that there's been some awkward cases where it's actually gone further than that. Now, the good news is, you know, that your stuff is protected. That's what they say here. Again, depending on how much you trust the overall system, right? So, Got to factor that in for yourself. And it's been working well over the years. This is SIPC, which is the um, protected, you know, Securities and um, Investor Protection Commission, right? Um, and at any rate, you see there the number of claims. This comes from the SIPC's 2022 annual report that the number of claims has just gone. Brrr, it's been actually zero for a number of years. There have been no claims. There have been no brokerage defaults. Nobody's lost any money and all this stuff. However... That's in a regime of excessive Federal Reserve money printing. So the system's been highly liquid. And of course, you can cover up a lot of shenanigans as long as there's stupid amounts of money sloshing around. Now, but some bad news. Uh, this is in October of 2020. Right here, a couple of SEC commissioners said hmm, they were so bummed with a, a particular non-action that happened in, in the system that they wrote about it and came out with it. And they said last night, a no action letter was issued relating to apparent noncompliance 
by certain broker dealers, I'd like to know who, regarding Rule 15C3-3, which is aptly named the Customer Protection Rule. Huh? In short, certain broker dealers' failure to comply with the Customer Protection Rule, whoops, remember they're not allowed to commingle or encumber or hypothecate or do any of that stuff with cash accounts or margin or excess margin securities, they did. And so what happened? Well, they got a no action letter, which the, the letter clearly states these practices are not consistent with the requirements of the laws. That, that'd be like saying, look, um, Chris, we know you robbed that bank, but, uh, and those aren't consistent with the laws that we have, but you know, we're not going to take action on that right now. So, so we've seen that this cheating has happened and I've covered many of these cases again for subscribers. So you just, you have to be aware that's the system we operate in. Now, this is really important. We also found out in our investigation that security contracts are actually something that are part of something called qualified financial contracts. And that is a big old list. It's a big old, yeah, these are qualified financial contracts right here. <laughs> if you can read the zero point font over there, right? Uh, and, and that includes um, securities, but it also includes derivatives. So derivatives are qualified, part of the qualified financial contracts, and that includes forward contracts, repos, swaps, all this stuff, right? All of the derivatives out there. And this is an issue for us because these qualified financial contracts, they are not avoidable by the receiver. If a, if your broker clearinghouse, if one of these big parties, if DTCC went into receivership and they had qualified financial contracts, the holders of those qualified financial contracts, they can actually accelerate, terminate, um, otherwise, you know, just execute, make, make their qualified financial contracts, go to the top of the pack, receive, take their funds back or their assets back out of that whole system. And the, even the trustee can't do anything about that. They're, by law, they are not allowed to prevent this. Again, this is to simply protect the system. It's saying, look, we're just scared. We, it would be really bad if some customers lost some money. It would be even worse if the system stopped. So remember with Timothy Geithner, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, too big to fail. And, oh, my gosh, there are these globally systemically important banks. And then there were systemically important financial institutions, sci-fis, GSIBs, blah, blah, all their acronyms. They're like, oh, this would be terrible if one of these systemically important institutions went down. Then it would be domino effect, like communism in Asia in the 70s, I guess. It would be this domino effect, and then the whole system comes down. That's what they're scared of. Now, they don't have an example of where that's happened before, and we don't know if these are legitimate concerns. But what will happen if one of these big banks goes down is a lot of very well-connected people will lose a lot of money. And, of course, that's the big no-no in this particular story. As we know from derivatives in the exploration into derivatives we did, I mean, here's 221 trillion with a T dollars of derivatives in just the four largest U.S. banks. Of course, the worldwide numbers are a lot larger. And so if one of the big banks starts to go down or we have a derivative accident and then we get to discover where in this system is all that collateral for those trillions of dollars of derivatives hanging out. And we don't know the answer to that. It's a big problem. So we have these unknowns, right? We don't know what happens if there's a bankruptcy at any one of these levels down here below me. We don't know what happens if one of those, if there's a bankruptcy in one of those squares or boxes or circles over there. We don't know. We don't know what would happen. And I couldn't find this out. This is a big problem for me. I was trying to find out a very simple answer to a very simple question, which is how much of that overall ecosystem that we see over there in that big complicated box how does it does it tally up, right? It should be very simple. There are this many shares issued and the accounts think they hold this many. Is that the same number? Or there or there do people think they or more people think they own shares than actually exist? We should know that, right? And we don't know the answer to that. And it ought to be dead simple to answer that. And we can't. I can't. I couldn't find it. So we have to default to sort of derivative, our own derivative investigation, which is say, well, what if the depository trust corporation itself what if it got in trouble? You know, what, what if what if it went bankrupt? Well, we we see that uh, they they claim to have, you know, what's that, $4 billion plus down there. But you find out that most of that, those blue boxes, that's stuff that's cash that they're holding for to participants and owe to participants. So we back those pieces. We're like, ah, we don't care about that. That's a wash, right? 
you, you, you're holding something and you owe it. It's not, it's both an asset and a liability, but it, that cancels. What is, what do you have for yourself, DTCC? I mean, DTC, what do you have? Uh, they have about 500 million bucks on this balance sheet. This is peanuts. <laughs> this is nothing in the, in the world we're discussing here. But just to be clear, DTC in that yellow box over there is just a part of the larger corporation of the DTCC, which has all these other boxes, which includes um, they've got a government securities division. They got a mortgage backed securities division, which is all part of their fixed income clearing corporation. So they've got clearing corporations. They've got a solutions thing. They've got Euroclear. Um, they, they've got all these different national securities clearing corporation, NSCC. They've got, man. This is a big, this is a lot bigger. So what's DTCC have on its balance sheet? Again, those two top yellow boxes, that's wash. We're just going to factor those out. Oh, they got about $3 billion to their name in total that they could, uh, you know, sort of uh, put against any sort of large hiccup that might happen in their system. So this is such a central corporation right here. And again, this was set up by Bill Denser, who was before this job, a CIA asset, an agent who helped overthrow countries. Um, so interesting sort of a, a, a curriculum vitae. It's like, yes, Bill, you're the perfect man for this job. At any rate, uh, this is a very, very big, very complicated system right here. And so we should be able to pry into it and ask some simple questions, which is, well, what, what, do, you, what do you actually have? Here's the unknowns. Seed and Company, do they actually hold all the shares everyone thinks that they own? Do they settle? Do they balance? Do we have a, a registrar system where in accounting, assets, liabilities, sum to zero? Do we know, can we, can we do that? Can we just say, listen, here's what you think's in the system. And when we add up everybody's brokerage accounts, here's what they think they own. Do those settle? Um, I can't answer that question. I don't know. I couldn't find it out. DTCC. How much are they lending on collateral and how good all are all of their systems when they're doing all of this stuff? You know, they have to, there's some big stuff going on in here. Um, how much collateral are they getting and what are their systems and do they function function well? I guess they sort of do, but I don't know. It's just an unknown. And it shouldn't be as I'm a good researcher. It should not be as I couldn't figure out the answer to it. I don't know. Very opaque. And as well, derivatives. You know, what happens if we have a derivative busting event and now we have all these clearing members and clearing parties, they're sitting in that big ecosystem of stuff moving around, they're holding on to collateral. If there's a big move, right, suddenly, I don't know, people get caught on the wrong side of like a big upthrust in gold or there's a big breakdown in, um, you know, cross-border settlement systems or there's a huge busting move in, in some sovereign debt. Then if that gets wiped out, how does that ripple through the system? We, we don't know. I, we, we just, I can't possibly tell you what's going on there. Now, some other unknowns is, well, how much naked shorting happens? Sh naked shorting is the practice of selling shares, selling stock shares. You don't actually have. It's called naked shorting. Like, like can you imagine if I just sold you a million shares of Tesla and you bought them and then Tesla goes up 10 bucks and you try and sell those and it turns out, you didn't have anything. You, you would have bought vaporware from me. Like there's nothing there. Does this happen? Oh yeah, it happens all the time. One way is we know that it's actually allowed by law. This is part of um, uh, Reg SHO in this rule 203B2 down there in yellow, um, which says that, um, yeah, let me see what we got there. Yeah, uh, it, it provides an exception to the locate requirement, which is you know, if I sell a share short, I have to locate one. I mean, here's how it's supposed to work. I'm supposed to borrow a share. I've located it, and then I can sell it. That's legitimate shorting. Naked shorting is when you just sell something and you haven't located it. So they say here, provides an exception to the locate requirement, right? As long as it's a market maker, you know? Um, and, and, and they don't have to, if you're a market maker, you don't have to locate the shares. You can just sell them. You just sell them. They don't exist. So if you remember the whole GameStop, that's GME ticker symbol. If you remember the GameStop story back in 2021, this is crazy. Quote from this article in, in uh, Yahoo Finance. Though the SEC made naked short selling illegal in 2008, because that's when that rule came in. Instances of naked short selling have occurred in the U.S. since. And a famous example happened fairly recently with GameStop shares. The most infamous recent example of naked short selling 
was the GameStop saga of 2021 where traders reportedly sold short 140% of its shares. And when you sell a share short and you can't locate it, it's what's called a delivery failure, right? So look at this uh, Bloomberg chart down here. It shows GameStop appeared on the SEC list every day at the end of January, every single day. And those are in millions of shares. So they were, some days they were like, oh yeah, somebody sold a million shares that they didn't have, just sold them, didn't have them. So this was a hedge fund that just was making these shares up out of thin air and throwing them in because they were about to get reamed because people had figured out how short they were. And instead of losing money like you should because you were on the wrong side of the trade, they fraudulently just made shares up out of thin air and kept throwing paper shares at the price until it overwhelmed any possible ability of the retail investors from Wall Street bets on the other side, mostly, who were trying to buy those shares up, but they were buying fake shares. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's the system. And it's right there in print. They're like, oh yeah, naked short selling, totally illegal, except for a market maker under certain circumstances. Very rare. No, it's not rare. This is what happens. And so this speaks to a collusive system where insiders, if they get caught on the wrong side of a bet, they can just willy-nilly just manufacture as many unlimited shares out of thin air as they want. And so this is a fraudulent system and sell those into the system to drive the, the shares to where they want. We saw this happen in AMC as well. These are fails to deliver. Look at these numbers, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, all the way on up to nearly 50 or it's just over 50 million shares failed to settle there in August of 2023. Excuse me. Unbelievable. This is this really? You can't just do that. Or you can, but you should get caught and you should get perp walked and go to jail. And that way, your, your other hedge fund buddies would go, uh, maybe I should not do that. You know? Uh, it doesn't matter. The, here's how it is the system runs. And of course, you know, nobody's been more on top of this over, over time, I think, in many ways than Patrick Byrne of Overstock. And here's from this uh, deep capture reporting, which is amazing. You should look into it. Meanwhile, Patrick has bought 50,000 shares of Overstock and made a simple request. So this is the CEO of Overstock buying 50,000 of his own shares through his brokerage account and made a simple request that real stock be delivered. Get the delivery. No fail to deliver. I want the, I bought it. Cash went out my account, like 50,000 shares, big number. Cash goes out the account. I want my shares. Deliver them. After weeks of equivocation, a broker at Wells Fargo wrote to Patrick in an email, it would seem that Lehman Brothers, the Wall Street brokerage, did not have the shares when they sold them to us. So now we have two for, like, we've got Lehman Brothers selling shares they don't have, being bought by Wells Fargo, who then attempted to deliver them to Patrick Byrne. Nobody had them. They didn't exist. Fantasy shares. Thin air, right? Um. Since Overstock is a hot slash, you know, quote, manipulated stock, they are finding it just about impossible to find shares to borrow or buy. Talking with my traders, they feel that no one seems to have enough of the shares to deliver. So it seems Patrick bought 50,000 shares of Air, phantom stock. If you say, wow, that sounds fraudulent, it's because it is. If you say, wow, that sounds illegal, that's because it is. If you say, wow, those people who did that should have gotten in trouble and gone to jail, that's because they should have, but nothing happened. Wash, rinse, repeat. This is the system we have, okay? So that's a really important insight into the overall psychology of what I've learned after digging so deeply into the great taking is just looking into this sausage-making factory of our markets and realizing that I now understood why they seem so fraudulent from time to time and why somebody rides to the rescue so frequently to just drive the price up into the right because this whole system, if it had to finally settle out, and it, it actually, this is why GameStop was so dangerous. This is why AM, AMC was so dangerous. This is why Overstock so dangerous. Because any one of these little things, if taken to its conclusion, could reveal that the system is fraudulent in these examples and probably others. Because, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, tip of the iceberg. What you can't see is usually larger than what you can see. Uh, that we would find out that the larger system can't settle. That there are more claims or people who think they own something than actually exist. That if the people who have been busy gaming the system and gaming it for their own benefit had to settle up, that would be very difficult for them. And hedge funds would take losses and big banks would take losses and that would be terrible. We'd have to, oh no, 
they would go crying to Big Daddy Warbucks to try and get Congress to change the law. Now, here's some more good news, however. Good news. Good news. Um, I don't know why this is an oilprice.com, but a great reporting. This is from the editor. This is from October 16th, 2023. Quote, American investors have been taken for a trillion dollar ride by naked short sellers in what could turn out to be the biggest financial regulatory scandal in North American history. Let that sink in. While what is now an all-out war on naked short sellers intensifies, there is a new flashpoint on the front line, and this is really important, a potentially devastating ruling targeting those who are alleged to make short, naked short selling possible, the facilitators, the bankers, and brokers. So the hedge funds can, can go out there and, 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 you know, private equity and all these other people can attempt to naked short sell, and the brokers and banks to this point have been like, ah, uh, blind eye, right? Now this ruling says, oh, you're actually responsible, brokers and bankers. This is going to put the complete kibosh on a lot of stuff. And this could actually really reveal how deep the rot has been in the system. And it is magnificently deep. Okay. On September 29th, Federal District Court Judge Lorna Schofield in the Southern District of New York, very important, that district court in New York, this is where all the major financial stuff comes out of, issued a ruling that has the potential to significantly disrupt Wall Street compliance and is a major first step towards protecting retail investors from fraud. Harrington Global Opportunity Fund Limited v. CIBC World Markets. Judge Schofield found that broker-dealers may be primarily liable for manipulative trading initiated by their customers because they serve as gatekeepers of trading on securities exchanges. Oh, you don't say. Consequences for the people who deserve them? This is very out of character for the justice system. So this actually gives me some hope. Uh, this is really good. So I hope that the ruling sticks and doesn't get overturned on appeal or something like that. But, you know, we'll have to see how this all shakes out. At any rate, um, so the other thing we discovered, which, uh, which is an extension, which was a new stuff that we were uh, finding out that went beyond what we found in the Great Taking book is because is, it led right to it, is that there's this thing called... Um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC. And it turns out that there's all this code written in now that the FSOC can get convened if or when it feels like systemic financial risk is a thing. And if they believe that there's a systemic risk determination, they say, oh my gosh, this could create financial system instability. Now that's not defined anywhere. Crazy, I know, but I couldn't find a single definition. It's not like here's a litmus test. This is, this is important. Like, Guess what? Now they just make stuff up, right? You know, oh, J.P. Morgan's about to lose some money. That's a financially, systemically important event, right? It's just as crazy as it looks. But at any rate, if the FSOC gets invoked, if Financial Stability Commission comes on board and they invoke financial stability, they can just do whatever they want to do at that point. They can just make stuff up. No way you say, Chris, that's stupid talk. Okay, here's a case. Um, and this was uh, not around securities, but around what happened when Silicon Valley Bank broke down. They say here, you know, we all know this, that the FDIC, which is a related concept to SIPC, but different because it applies to bank accounts, not brokerage accounts. The FIC, D, D, FDIC insures bank deposits up to 250 k per customer. We know that per account type. We know that. Uh, unfortunately, quote, most of the accounts in the Silicon Valley Bank held more than $250,000 of deposits, meaning most of the funds were uninsured. And in most cases, this would mean account holders would lose any money above that threshold. Ouch. To help, the Federal Reserve announced, uh, the Federal Reserve announced on March 12th that it would invoke a systemic risk exception. Ding! One, one regional bank, and they're already like invoking invoking the systemic risk exception, meaning that all depositors would be made whole, even for those funds that were uninsured. Um, so uh, here's the clue. They're going to invoke a financial system stability clause at the drop of a hat whenever they worry about it. And what, what are they actually worried about? Well, it seems they were worried about people discovering what the Ponzi scheme here is, because look, this is just hysterical. Same article from Investopedia. Good article, by the way. They do good writing down. I like their uh, investigations and their writing. It's very fair. Federal regulators decided to fully insure and protect all of SVB's depositors in their balances for fear of contagion. The impact of the bank's collapse could have on economy as a whole. Other banks saw their stock prices drop too. Oh no, that sounds like contagion. Oh no. 
<laughs> right? Stock price is going down, not up and to the right. Emergency is <laughs> declared. A high-profile bank failure like this one could reduce consumer confidence in the banking system. Well, is it well-deserved confidence or does it deserve to be reduced a little, right? That would be a good question. Um, they say account holders rushing to withdraw deposits from a bank that doesn't have funds to cover them. Like it's a bad thing. Um, if I have, if I'm an account holder at a bank that doesn't have, that can't have the funds to cover the deposits, I maybe shouldn't be banking at that bank. Like they're talking like, oh no, we have to protect that system where banks don't have enough funds to cover the deposits. We, we got to protect that system. I mean, just the way it's phrased, it's just ridiculous to me. Ultimately, this risk of contagion could affect not just banks, but the economy as a whole. I'm thinking if you take your money out of one of these banks that's not working well, you probably have to put it in another bank and maybe you pick the bank that is working well. What they're really saying here is it's systemically important to us. It's a question of stability that even the worst of the banks aren't exposed as frauds. I mean, that's literally what's being said here. And it's just gross and, and it is what it is. All right. So uh, beyond that, though, uh, we, we don't know what the FSOC will do, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, but they'll invoke some crazy stuff and they'll just throw taxpayer money at stuff and make people whole, I guess. We, we could always count on that. But there's no transparency. This was from a comment section to the SEC. They had a ruling that was coming up and a really astute person put in this comment and said, hey, um, and this is part of a big, long response they had. There's the link to it down there if you want to read the whole thing. They said, well, you know, we're looking here at the DTCC and they got the prime brokers and they have all these different customers. And they said, um, by the way, in yellow, the DTCC is owned by the prime brokers. Oh, it's true. And as a closely held private enterprise, it is impenetrable. It actively and aggressively fights all efforts to obtain information regarding naked shorting with or without a subpoena. So this is just in context of naked shorting. I was just trying to ask basic reconciliation questions like, how much do you think you're holding in trust for people through your seed and company subsidiary? And how many shares are outstanding? Do those balance? We should have an answer to that. By the way, are these pools actually segregated in the meaning, in the sense that the margin account securities and the other ones that those are, are those not touching? Do those boxes not touch? You know, I couldn't get even the most basic of questions. And I was trying to get um, a simple question, which is how many fails to deliver do we have? How many persistent fails to deliver? How big is naked shorting? I couldn't find any data around that. All I could find were sort of general articles that said, oh, it's not as big of a problem as it used to be. Great. How big did it used to be and how big is it now? I couldn't find the answers. So very poor transparency, which of course lowers my trust in the system. But that's how I'm built. Uh, as well, the, you know, a risk is some sort of systemic freeze. There's lots of things. It could be a derivative fat tail event that sort of like blows up the collateral system. It could be so, just run of the mill liquidity event that causes one of these. I just put some random red X's somewhere in the system to sort of show like once you take one of those lines out, the whole system doesn't work. Like that's the point. This whole thing needs to function. You can't have one of those boxes or lines suddenly stop working because one of those boxes, which is a company, an entity, a person in legal speak, suddenly fails to function because it's it's gone into you know receivership or it's just you know, blown up uh, you know economically or financially. Then the whole thing stops working. So it could be just a run of the mill liquidity event. It could be overt and systemic fraud is revealed in the system. Like oh. <laughs> naked shorting's half the trade volume. Who knew? Or something like that. It could be malware. It could be hacking. It could be one of those things. It could be an electromagnetic pulse, an EMP, or other grid down event. Uh-oh. That creates a whole different set of risks. Or it could be an in-country attack by invader assault teams. And I use invader word carefully. If you've been following me, you know what that refers to, of course, on our infrastructure, right? Speaking of which, uh, I'm not going to cover this, but if you're interested in what I'm talking about, you maybe want to look this up. That is a super interesting story back from 2013 and relates to that last bullet right there. I'll just leave that there for now. So here's my summary for today. The Great Taking, it's done a great service. Thank you, David Rogers Webb, for this really stellar work here. Its major claims are real. Yes, these are security entitlements. You don't actually own the own stuff directly anymore. Qualified financial contracts, they, yeah, they have seniority in this system. Pooled assets, yeah, they're all pooled, um, you know, with vague areas about control and what constitutes control and who actually has control 
And yes, harmonization across all sorts of different uh, jurisdictions. So there's really no escaping this, whether you're in Europe or Canada or Australia or here. Um, and case precedents also have been set. I went further than the book to discover that this op system is opaque. Shit. You know, can't, can't figure out what's actually, it's really complicated by design, right? Uh, the risks, I can't quantify the risks. I have no idea because I can't tell you how much shorting there is, naked shorting. I can't tell you how much has been collateralized. I can't tell you what the quality of that collateral is. I can't tell you who owns it. I can't tell you where it's controlled. I don't know where it's sitting. It's too big. It's too much, right? Um, miscreants have not been properly punished. I showed you the case where like the SEC is like, hmm, you shouldn't have done that with those, with those uh, cash accounts. So frowny face, you know, no action letter, right? That's bad. So that those are trust breaking legal decisions. On the other side of that, we have that 2023 naked shorting per, uh, legal thing, which actually could restore trust. So again, to everybody in the system, you're either, in the legal system, you're either reinforcing trust or you're eroding trust. Please, no more rulings. We don't care what you think as a judge. Just make decisions based on the law. And then at least we have a fighting chance because we can set the law and then the law has to be interpreted and you make a decision off of that law, but you don't rule because you feel like it would be inappropriate for JP Morgan to lose money this week, right? Stop that. Nobody has been able to tell me how much collateralization, hypothecation, rehypothecation actually exists, where it sits, uh, and which financial assets have been encumbered or for which control has shifted. So please, please, please take, take action now to protect your wealth. And we've got a webinar coming up around that. Otherwise, please come to Peak Prosperity, join up, become a member. You owe it to yourself. We talk about this and other things with this level of context. We did this with COVID. We did this with Fukushima when it happened. We do this with the financial system. I do this with energy, energy systems. You deserve to have these conversations. But most importantly, at Peak Prosperity, we have an incredible tribe of people who are smart and intelligent and open-minded, and we have a community. And you are cordially invited to come be part of that community. And we'd love to see you there. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for listening. You are truly one of the information warriors out there. God bless you. I'm your Information Scout signing out on this particular series for now. Hope to see you at the webinar on June 15th. Bye-bye.